Ambassador Pickering uh, has had a very uh, a remarkably distinguished career. Uh, he held so many important positions in the State Department that they, that they named a fellowship after him uh, for people they would like to recruit uh, to the Foreign Service. I'd just like to, you know, I don't usually do this, but I'd like to just uh, go backward in time the appointments that he held in, in the State Department. Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Ambassador to Russia, Ambassador to India, Ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador to Israel, Ambassador to El Salvador, Ambassador to Nigeria, Assistant uh, Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, Ambassador to Jordan. Before that, he served in the Navy, the State Department's uh, Bureau of International of Intelligence and Research, the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and as a political advisor to the U.S. delegation to the Conference on Disarmament in, in Geneva. He also was Special Assistant to the Secretaries of State Rogers and Kissinger. Since retiring from the State Department 10 years ago, Ambassador Pickering has been advising NGOs and businesses involved in foreign affairs. And one of the issues that he's been involved in during the past decade has been the crisis over Iran's nuclear program. So we've asked him to talk about Iran's nuclear program. Can diplomacy help? And if anybody could provide an answer, he can. Thank you, Frank, very much. I'm pleased and honored to be invited to come to Princeton. It isn't always often that one gets invitations uh, to come here and to see the students and address a group like this. I don't pretend to have special expertise in Iran, even though I've had my nose rubbed in it for some time. And I don't pretend to have particularly salient or miraculous answers to what is a deep and intractable problem in US foreign and security problems. What I do have is a certain amount of neuralgia and dyspepsia about our current policies. And so I hope tonight to address two broad subjects with you. A friend of mine once said, every good Methodist sermon has three parts, and I'm lacking tonight. But you'll forgive me. Maybe we'll make it up in time. I want to talk a little bit about, the, about Iran and the Iranian program, to put it in perspective, and to say something about current policies, and then to turn the question to what might be helpful future policies to deal with Iran and with the Iranian nuclear program. And I guess then my third part is to open it up, Frank, if I may, to you for your comments, criticisms, tomatoes, eggs, or questions. Uh, in the upshot of all of this, Iran remains a particularly and peculiarly important country for us all. It sits astride an important area of the world, a fragmented and difficult area. It's in the middle of the two wars we never should have engaged in and want to get out of. And it is a country whose historic civilization, whose language, whose pride, whose definition of its own future is particularly important and not necessarily simple or easy to deal with. Uh, it is a country that can affect security in the region and beyond. A country with regional aspirations, as we see it, uh, but a country which, from which we have been estranged and divided since 1978 and 1979, and one that is particularly difficult for us to deal with. I think Iranians must feel the same way a sense of suspicion, uncertainty, and certainly a lack of trust that exists between our two countries. In no way enhanced by the lack of communication that we have had with each other over the years, where except for very rare occasions, we have had very little direct contact, where we are reduced to written communications through Switzerland, the protecting power, or through others who, for one reason or another, are prepared 
to provide information back and forth. Iran, as you all know, had a revolution in 1979 which resulted in a sea change with the Shah out and with a theologically inspired government in. I've avoided the use of words like theocratic, although it is hard to escape the notion that it is applicable to the current Iranian regime. A regime that has had its own ups and downs. A regime with which we quickly had a major 444 day crisis with the taking of our embassy and its personnel hostage in 1979. A country which then slipped into a war with Saddam Hussein. Uh, I'm convinced that Saddam precipitated the war. It lasted eight years. It resulted in enormous carnage on each side. And for those of you who have visited Iran, I was there once since the war in 2004. You cannot help but be impressed by the memorials to the martyrs of that war painted on the open sides of apartment buildings at least a minimum of four stories high. It is, in a sense, a part of the Iranian national heritage and national epic and is added to their deep concern about security, their deep concern about the outside potential for intervention and the stability of their region and their regime and conditions much of the current environment. Uh, and one cannot help but be impressed, obviously, uh, by their persistence, their perseverance, and their willingness to move in directions that at least try to protect their revolution. The revolution is not without its opposition. And indeed, I think a significant setback for the ability of both sides to bring relationships closer together in the, the period of the Obama administration uh, was, in my view, the elections in Iran in June 12, 2009, in which President Ahmadinejad was re-elected, but with deep concern uh, inside and outside Iran about the legitimacy of that election. This resulted in the evolution and emergence of a green movement, uh, which persisted for some time, but now has been pretty much seriously suppressed in Iran. Uh, we in the United States have watched these developments with concern uh, and being estranged from Iran have few independent sources of information on what is happening there. Turning to the subject of the afternoon, Iran's nuclear program, I think that all of us share a deep concern and worry that that program is leading Iran toward nuclear weapons despite protestations and indeed arguments advanced by Iran to the contrary. I will try to describe that program as much as I can in what I hope are dispassionate ways but trying to pass on to you some of the concern as well as some of the confusion and difficulty in dealing with it. There's no question that Iranian nuclear ambitions began under the shock. And I think that uh, recent information, as well as perhaps persistent and older information, indicated that while the Shah's ostensible interest was in civil nuclear power and nuclear research, uh, there was, I think, legitimate reason to harbor concerns that he saw beyond that toward a military effort. It did not get well underway in development at the time of the revolution and for a period of time as the Iranians attempted to consolidate their own revolution, there was not a lot of focus on the problem in part as well, some of the diversion of the Iraq war. But in addition to that, some of the fact that Iraq was itself seen as deeply engaged in developing a military nuclear program for itself and deep concern about Saddam Hussein obviously had its effect on Iran. Uh, Iran emphasized in its program uh, the development of a capacity to use nuclear power to produce electricity. 
often argued against on the western side by the fact that it had one of the world's largest oil and gas reserves and as a result the notion that it had to resort uh, to nuclear power to meet its needs seemed to be in effect a cover for a program to obtain and develop capabilities in the nuclear area for purposes beyond civilian use. Uh, those were answered by Iran in its own way by saying that oil and gas were valuable commodities. It needed the opportunity to develop alternative sources of power to extend its capacity to produce oil and gas for as long as possible. This was not something that was totally in Iran's interest, but in the interest of the international community to continue to have access to this scarce resource. And obviously, anybody who follows oil prices know the longer you can keep it in the ground, generally speaking, the more valuable the resource is when you get it out. Uh, we also, I think, need to note that Iran, as it developed its nuclear power, ran into great difficulties. The United States and others were directly opposed. I can recall in my service in Moscow in the early 1990s, the U.S. position was that Iran should not develop any nuclear capacity, in part predicated on the notion that we had estranged and difficult relations with the Iranian leadership, that the Iranian leadership did not have the best interests of us, or perhaps even the region at heart. Uh, it was untrustworthy. And moving in a program that allowed it an opportunity, or permitted it an opportunity, or gave it an opening for an opportunity to move in a military fashion would constitute an inevitable danger to us, to our friends in the Middle East, and to the world community. Some of these ideas continue, obviously, to prevail, and it's one of the reasons why we're here discussing the question this afternoon. Iran proceeded through a series of developments. It contracted with Germany for a large power reactor on the Persian Gulf. Uh, that was set back by pressure from the United States and the West. The project was later picked up by the Russians and completely rebuilt, uh, finished last year. The latest I've heard it is still undergoing some work by the Russians to assure its effective operation. And while it has been online, I think sporadically, and Frank, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, it still is in a, in a put it this way, an uncertain set, set, sense, not fully operational. Yeah. Um, Iran also developed at the same time a serious interest in, as it puts it, being self-sufficient in the provision of nuclear fuel for this power program, uh, including investing in and developing, perhaps borrowing technology from other sources, uh, a centrifuge program to enrich uranium. And as all of you know, that while Iran is a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, committed under that treaty not, into, not to go into military activities, uh, and permitted under that treaty to develop so-called sensitive technologies, enrichment and reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel for the recovery of plutonium. Nevertheless, this heightened and indeed increased the level of concern and nervousness in the United States and Europe in particular. Uh, the policy was, uh, and I think remains, although I'll discuss this in a little more detail, uh, that Iran should not enrich, it should not enrich if that is all possible, if that's conceivable. Uh, and this, of course, raised major questions with Iran, which felt it had the right to do so, that the West was seeking uh, to further constrain its independence and activities, uh, particularly in the nuclear area. Uh, there have been several fatwa statements by the Iranian Supreme Leader and others uh, that at least incline to the direction in a significant way that nuclear weapons are not permissible and that Iran, in effect, uh, therefore will not go there. There are concerns, in effect, that uh, parts of the Iranian program, secrecy, 
burying its facilities deep underground, particularly its enrichment facilities. Uh, a purported or purported work seen on Iranian computers, uh, having plans for nuclear warhead design and so on, that Iran's intentions were here were not as benign, benign uh, as the Iranians proclaim. Uh, the IAEA, the International Inspection Mechanism, which overlooks the Iranian program, has some questions that are unanswered about the Iranian program, which further reflect negatively on the program, its activities, and its eventual destination. Uh, all of this has meant that over the last several years, in repeated efforts, both on the part of the Europeans and in the Obama administration, and at the end of the Bush administration, the Europeans joined by the United States, there have been efforts to try to negotiate a solution to the outstanding differences over the Iran program and a set of limitations that would satisfy the West that could be accepted by Iran with respect to its programs. Uh, these have not borne fruit. There remain serious differences between the sides. There remains the uncertainty about Iran's intentions and indeed uncertainty about how and in what way uh, the programs can be brought together. Each side has a different set of policy prescriptions uh, going into the future. <coughs> On the Iranian side, uh, through a process of public information and indeed focusing on Iranian national pride and intentions, its ability to make technical progress, the centrifuge enrichment program has become a symbol of national achievement. And in that sense, from the Iranian perspective, an irreversible symbol of national achievement. On the US and Western side, there has been deep and ongoing concern that the enrichment program uh, can lead uh, to the capacity to move from the low level of enrichment required for civil reactors to the higher levels available uh, for nuclear weapons and usable in nuclear weapons. And indeed, as a side issue, the Iranians have, as a result of support from the United States during the period of Shah, a research reactor which is currently being used to produce medical isotopes, uh, which requires, in its present configuration, uranium at a higher level of enrichment, 20%. Uh, which is another big jump on the way to material that might be useful in a bomb. Uh, there is no longer for Iran uh, a store of outside provided fuel for this reactor. And so, as many of you remember, over the past year there have been various thoughts and ideas about whether Iran might trade in some of its low enriched uranium to obtain fuel rods or fuel elements or fuel cores for this reactor uh, put at a higher level of enrichment and fabricated outside of Iraq. They have not borne fruit, but within recent days, Iran has once again opened the possibility that since it was enriching to 20% with the potential of providing uh, fuel for this research reactor, uh, that it would discontinue that and perhaps cease if it could obtain the equivalent fuel from Western sources, uh, an opportunity perhaps for further investigation. The United States and the Western Europeans who have been involved in this, and principally the United Kingdom, France, and Germany, uh, have a general view that it consistent with the United Nations resolutions which they sponsored and passed, that there ought to be a hiatus, a gap, a freezing, a stand down in Iran enrichment. And that at the same time, while on the part of the United States at least, there was a willingness to speak to Iran about all of the outstanding issues between the United States and Iran, uh, there needed to be a firm commitment in any such conversations that the nuclear issue would be a priority 
a, a major focus of bilateral attention. Uh, this brings us to where we are today. There are, as we see, gaps between the sides. There have been, for some time, no conversations. It may be that recent visits of President Ahmadinejad and his foreign minister in New York and some of the suggestions about potential flexibility would serve a useful opportunity in reopening those kinds of contacts, but it is not sure. It is not sure as well uh, that either the United States or Iran is correctly positioned uh, to develop those contacts, whether they are in a multilateral context or purely bilateral between the United States and Iran. In the past, it appeared as if Iran wished to talk to the United States because it believed the United States was the fundamental driver of Western policy on this question. That seems less certain now. There have been, as many of you have read in the paper, indications that activities to slow down the Iranian program, that's the polite euphemism for saying sabotage, have in effect made a difference in the pace and activity in Iran. Uh, but the certainty is that they have not stopped the program and there is even some evidence that the Iranians as a result have tried to speed the program, introduce new and more productive types of centrifuges, said that they would move some of their higher level of enrichment, the 20% activity, uh, to a new facility hollowed out of a mountain near Qum, uh, which was prepared in secret but declared and discovered last year. Uh, all of this obviously means that uh, we continue to face serious difficulties. Uh, what can be done about this? The policy options are those that are usual in Washington. They reduce themselves to three. In all of these formulations, two of them are usually impossibly difficult. So let me go over them for you and then perhaps make some suggestions about how in the one area where policy might conceivably proceed, uh, my suggestions would to be to Washington as to how to try to open up the process rather than to continue to see it shut down. The three options are obviously to sit back and enjoy life, and if Iran chooses to become a nuclear weapons power, let it do so. The current thinking in America is that Iran has not yet made that decision and that intelligence reporting which appears in public has indicated that about 2003 there were indications that Iran stopped activities that looked like they might lead to a military end. There is a new report that has been prepared the leaks have not yet fully conveyed what it says, but there are some indications that the confidence about the 2003 date has been shaken by some items of information. The United States, uh, in my view, uh, is not wise in accepting the idea that there is nothing it can do and Iran should be allowed to proceed in whatever direction it wishes to go up to and including what I think is a general consensus that Iran would like to put itself in a position, even though it hasn't decided uh, to manufacture a nuclear weapon, to have everything in preparation ready to be able to do so at short notice, a kind of breakout scenario. Uh, this would cause a number of difficulties. First and foremost, it would, in the view of most, lead to serious efforts on the part of neighboring Arab states, Turkey and the rest of the Arab world, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, perhaps the UAE, themselves to energize and move ahead with their own programs of nuclear development as a way of at least countering or checkmating an Iran weapon. Uh, it would lead as well in my view, certainly to greater destabilization in the region. And it would certainly work against the long-term professed goal of President Obama 
uh, to move himself and the world in the direction of eliminating nuclear weapons if that can feasibly be done. Uh, it would uh, certainly represent an abandonment of a policy that we have pursued quite vigorously in the President's statement that he doesn't prepare to permit Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, the second possibility for a policy is military action. Many have commented and studied it. It's worth a lecture on its own. I won't delve into all of the issues. But I think I could reduce the comment on military action to the fact that there are only two principal problems with it. One is that given an uncertainty about the target set and what is actually happening in Iran, it is unlikely to solve the problem. It may well set things back for a while. And for some, including Israel, that may be an acceptable alternative. Uh, but it is not certain that it will happen. And the certainty that it might actually be effective would be increased only if we entered Iran on land and took control of the territory. And the enthusiasm in the United States for a third war in this very difficult region as we try to extract ourselves from two uh, under the shadow, obviously, of an increasing debt burden is very limited. The second principal difficulty is that it puts Iran in an extremely advantageous position to repost. Uh, my deep concern would be that Iran would say an unprovoked attack gives us not only the right, but the necessity to produce a nuclear weapon. Beyond that, there are all sorts of asymmetrical responses against either the United States or Israel, the two presumed potential states that would use military force against an Iranian program. Uh, attacks against Israel by Hezbollah, by Hamas, uh, terrorist attacks against the U.S. and facilities around the world. Uh, deep concern, certainly on my part and by many others, that it would deeply antagonize the Islamic world to have an unprovoked attack because uh, such an attack would not have uh, international legitimacy or full backing against an Islamic State, uh, presumably with not a perfect proof that it had developed or was ready to break out to develop a nuclear weapon, and so on. So you're only limited by your imagination of difficulties. Uh, the risks seem far to outweigh the potential benefits, although there are differences between the US and Israel, in my view, on that particular subject. Um, the third. Uh, is the old one, uh, diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy, in some ways, looks like a very hard slog under these circumstances. And I think it is. But I think there are things that can be done, and I'll mention those in a few minutes, which could provide the potential for a new opening uh, if we were prepared uh, to take the steps and indeed some of the risks involved in doing so. Uh, the first element of a new diplomatic approach, in my view, would be one that I hinted at earlier, and that we should be prepared to propose to Iran uh, that we were willing to discuss all subjects that either side wanted to put on the table if they were willing to do so. And uh, while we would not insist <coughs> that nuclear be the first subject, it had certainly to be included in the corpus of subjects to be addressed. Secondly, with respect to the nuclear issue itself, it has been long my view shared with others uh, that we should accept Iran's right to enrich uranium uh, to levels consistent with civil nuclear power needs, but under full international inspection and in addition uh, with a clear opening for multilateral participation in the Iranian nuclear enrichment program to provide a greater degree of transparency. And in return for that particular step, which is seemingly very important to Iran, we ought to ask Iran to accept a very broad-gauged 
international inspection and monitoring approach, including, as many of you know, the additional protocol to the IAEA, which presents a possibility of much wider access, as well as additional steps coming out of our experience with Iraq and out of recent research on inspection and monitoring techniques, uh, which would provide us with the greatest capacity to assure ourselves that there was no diversion of Iranian activities in uranium enrichment or indeed the handling of spent fuels should that become an issue and that we had the greatest possibility of discovering uh, and knowing about any further clandestine activities in Iran in the nuclear area. Something that I think is important because our present approach is uh, no enrichment or at least a hiatus enrichment for which we are highly unlikely to get the kind of deep and very valuable inspection approach uh, that would be part of the proposal that I made. I think beyond that, it would be certainly important to think more broadly in the international nonproliferation context of some approaches that would help to facilitate that while at the same time strengthening the nonproliferation regime. One of which, building on the proposal with respect to Iranian enrichment and inspection, uh, would be to seek initially to get all five recognized nuclear powers under the nonproliferation treaty uh, China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom and the United States to accept a similar approach with respect to the enrichment that they do. All five are pledged neither to enrich nor reprocess plutonium for use in their military weapons programs. Such an approach involving some additional inspection and perhaps additional transparency through multilateral ownership uh, would reinforce uh, that effort, and in the absence of cooperation of necessary parties uh, to proceed with a treaty, uh, nailing down on a permanent basis that moratorium, this would provide a halfway step in that direction, but it would set an international standard, or it would tend to set an international standard uh, for all countries uh, that there would be no longer any possibility of enriching without multinational participation and pretty bright and pretty diverse and pretty effective inspection mechanisms. Something that uh, we ought to be concerned about because Brazil and Argentina, even Australia, are talking about moving in that direction. And in my view, there ought to be serious efforts to tighten up what has been called the loophole in the NPT, which permits these sensitive activities in ways that perhaps can escape notice and control. It might also be useful that while Israel, India, and Pakistan would not immediately be members of this kind of effort, uh, they too should be pushed to come in over a period of time. It should also, in my view, be useful to think about having the United Nations Security Council, which can act on these particular questions in light of its present mandate uh, itself, in effect, uh, to pass a resolution which might legislate these particular kinds of approaches to enrichment. I would hope that in addition to that, it would be possible to move to a phase out of reprocessing of spent fuel to recover plutonium ostensibly for use in civil power fuel for as long as such an activity was not economically competitive uh, with uranium fuel for our power programs, which seems to me to be a rather long time, and as a result, removes a second area of sensitive activities that could lead to military weapons uh, from the board. And the Security Council might be asked to reinforce it. A further step in the international proliferation regime would be something that so far has escaped us, but may be conceivable. 
And that is either an amendment to the NPT or, again, the use of the Security Council uh, to make it clear that any state that wishes in future to withdraw from the NPT should not have the capacity to enjoy the fruits of NPT cooperation when it was no longer a member, either through the application of special inspection mechanisms or the mandating of the shutting down facilities. Uh, this too would require serious leadership by the United States and the five permanent members of the Security Council, among others, to make happen. Uh, but it would be, I think, an important contribution <coughs> to the proliferation regime and it would be a further effort to signal to Iran that leaving the NPT and using what it derived as a member of the NPT to move in a military way uh, was opposed and may well be opposed in a serious way by the rest of the international community. Beyond that, there's been lots of discussion of other steps that might be taken, positive steps that might help build Iranian US and Iranian Western European cooperation. Uh, these could be useful in the context of broader talks. One does not want to, however, concentrate on sideshows at the expense of the major effort. But if there were indeed willingness, one could see in the context of further discussions with Iran, a number of confidence building measures which might help, particularly given the deep distrust that Iran has of US intentions. It is clear the Iranian prevailing view of the United States is that the United States wishes to change the Iranian regime. Some of those steps could begin to deliver to the current regime uh, on a reciprocal basis and to the United States uh, some serious steps that would provide for further security and stability. Let me just mention a few to give you a sense of what could be done. There is increasing concern among many that US military presence in the region close to Iran and Iranian presence close to the US, particularly in the waters of the Persian Gulf, could add to uncertainty. At the moment, there seems to be an agreement unwritten, almost unstated, between the US Navy and the Iranian Navy to try to avoid situations which bring them into uncertainty and potential conflict. The real problem is there is a second Navy in Iran belonging to the Revolutionary Guard, and it does not seem to consider itself yet a part of this deal. So further arrangements such as bringing together uh, all of the Iranian players into an arrangement to avoid uh, conflict, to enhance deconfliction would be useful. A further step might be a hotline between the United States and Iran, either on a military to military basis or otherwise, uh, to be used as we did with the Soviet Union to avoid misperception of intentions, to clarify uncertainties, and to serve as a backup uh, for rapid communications in times of emergency. Uh, we all know that the hotline was used effectively in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So it is not a new and untested possibility. Uh, I also believe that it would be seriously important to build on those steps by looking at an agreement such as we had with the Soviet Union on incidents at sea, uh, rules of the road, when our two navies and their ships are close together to avoid any conflict or misunderstanding. Uh, those would be important and perhaps that could be extended as long as US forces in the region uh, to the border areas of Iran with Iraq and with Afghanistan. I think it would be extremely important in building relationships with Iran uh, to begin talking to Iran particularly about efforts to curb the, uh, curb the Afghan drug trade, which has been of serious concern to them uh, and which they feel strongly about. There is also the question of each side's ability to help each other in dealing with the question of terrorism. And there has been uncertainty on the part of the United States as to whether, in fact, Iran 
has used its relationships or presumed relationships with Al Qaeda uh, against U.S. interests. And it could be helpful to clarify that. I think there are other questions uh, that could be dealt with in the confidence building regimes that we were talking about here. Some of those uh, would be areas of future cooperation. Uh, some of those uh, might involve, for example, cooperation in the area of health, well, which is important to both countries. Exchanges on a cultural basis. Exchanges in the area of athletics. There was a partial breakthrough with Iran some years ago when we set a wrestling team. Uh, maybe not the most appropriate notion for improving <laughs> relations, but the Iranians enjoy wrestling and find it interesting. Uh, and there are many others that one can think of. Language students, exchange of graduate students, many things that could be built up. The Iranians have a very strong interest uh, in having direct flights uh, from Tehran to the United States. Uh, having spent some time in the aviation industry, there is a clever way to begin this. Direct flights in the aviation industries are those that bear the same number. And it is entirely conceivable that one could have a foreign airline that could fly from Tehran to their own capital and from their own capital to Washington or New York under the same number and begin to meet the requirement for a direct flight. Perhaps our friends in Qatar, who already do this, just change the flight numbers. That would be very easy to accomplish. It would not bring Iranian planes into US airspace or American planes into Iranian airspace. Uh, but it would move to deal with something the Iranians continue to emphasize to us is important to them. Of course, it then leads to the very interesting question of what about visas? If you can't get a visa in Tehran, what good is a direct flight? And so maybe then we could open the possibility of issuing visas in Tehran. The Iranians issue visas in Washington. Uh, that would, in our requirements, have to have an American presence in Tehran. Uh, and the Iranians have said to me that since all the people who issue visas in Washington are dual citizens of the U.S. and Iran, they would like to have real Iranians in Washington. So you can see how some of these things could build, small as they are, and move in a more practical way uh, to bring about progress. Uh, there are numbers of other questions. I won't bore you with them now. The point is that confidence building measures, if handled well, could serve to reinforce confidence and build trust, which is entirely lacking at the present time, because it would represent both performance and recognition that we are dealing with the existing government, and something that would serve at least to argue against the notion that we seek their replacement. Finally, we need long-term objectives. And long-term objectives are not only dealing with the nuclear program and resolving our issues, whether they are in Afghanistan or Iraq, or, or with money outstanding from the Shah days, uh, or the consequences of actions that each of us has taken against each other if they remain undealt with, uh, or the questions of regime change or lack of trust, uh, but as well some of the practical questions. Uh, if we are going to be able to move with Iran in a long-term direction, then that certainly ought to be done under the commitment that there is an objective here of seeking to find a way to reestablish relations and have diplomatic establishments in each country. It will take a long time. It was not easy with China, nor with Vietnam, with, with other countries. But that would serve, once again, to reinforce the notion uh, that there is a future in the region that the U.S. policy is that the future of internal governance in Iran is up to Iran and its people, as hard as that is to accept for some, uh, because we know the nature of election processes in Iran is certainly less than we would desire <coughs> and may not yet even meet Jersey City standards. <laughs> but it is important, I think, to begin to open the door. I see a role for diplomacy, but a very difficult one. At the moment, all of that seems to be somewhere on a shelf in a back closet in the bureaucracies of both countries. Let us hope that some openings, uh, whether it is a new opportunity to deal with 20% enrichment or some other opening, can help us move ahead. 
Each of us faces elections. Elections are not a popular time to take risks. Uh, perhaps something will happen after elections. We can only hope. Uh, but it is in this vein, certainly, that I think it is important uh, that we do everything we can to exhaust diplomacy because the other options are really terrible. So thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. But the Russians, as you know, a month or so ago, made a proposal to Iran, which appears to be a step-by-step -step process that, according to my information, the step-by-step -step aspect of the process has found some interest in Washington. The real difficulty has been that the steps have been they move on the nuclear program and we take off sanctions. And that the Russian proposal, not a shock to anybody who's dealt with Russia, is very heavy on sanctions removal at the front end and very light on real movement until the back end. Uh, but one hopes that maybe there is something there to work with. Uh, grist for the mill, an opportunity and an opening. Uh, the Russians know very well that the uh, U.S. Uh, is not happy with the details even if the concept is appealing. So that provides an opening there that might be valuable. With respect to the broader program, Secretary Powell, as you know, the broader region, the Arab-Israeli question, Secretary Powell adopted the notion that the quartet, uh, the US, Russia, the UN, and the EU, could be very useful in facilitating the process of moving ahead. Uh, I don't want to get into deep detail on this particular question, except to say that, at the moment at least, uh, the problem in the Middle East is less what could be an appropriate plan uh, for uh, a peace solution based on two states than it is who are the players who are prepared to come forward to undertake the heavy lifting uh, to agree to the plan and get it accepted. And to some extent, uh, the United States, which has been seen as basically the facilitator and indeed the operator of heavy lifting in the Middle East is content at the moment uh, to sit quietly by uh, while the intransigence prevails. Uh, even more than Iran, I'm convinced, as I said to friends here today, that the bicycle principle on the Arab-Israeli question is still a salient problem. And the bicycle pr pr principle is quite simply, if you're not driving forward, you're falling down. Uh, and that maintenance of the status quo is a chimera in the Arab really question. It may be less of a chimera in the Iranian question, 
but it is at least an opportunity that things will not improve naturally of their own accord to see matters get worse. And so there is a cost in both cases, I think greater in the Arab-Israeli question than in the Iranian question, but nevertheless a cost. And while we may have bought some time in the Iranian program, that too is not endless. And so I think there are arguments for moving. They don't seem at the moment, however, to be strong enough uh, to push ahead uh, with uh, the leadership of the administration in making that happen. And as you say, others may attempt to fish or play in that pond. Thank you, Ambassador Pickering. Someone will um, recognize, will, will, will rescue us from you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. One of the aims of the NPT was to um, allow for, the, for guidance and technology to be transferred to less developed countries in order to prevent some kind of catastrophe from happening. And I've heard a lot of discussion about weaponization and nuclear weapons program or what have you, but um, the people I've spoken with, um, Iranians who I know, are much more concerned about a, a nuclear meltdown. And I was wondering if in policy circles, if in Washington, there's any concern that without some kind of diplomacy, um, the issue isn't a weapon, but the, the bigger issue is a, a nuclear meltdown. And I think that uh, I haven't heard of these Iranian concerns, but they're not irrelevant, obviously. Um, as I understand it, part of the major trade-off in the NPT is the technology and information to help provide for assurance of safety and security in the reactors involved, including uh, with a strong review internationally by the IAEA uh, to make sure that happens. Uh, the reactor in Iran that has been produced by the Russians is apparently at least capable of meeting the standards uh, to obviously, if correctly operated, avoid a meltdown. The Russians are not necessarily those with the most reassuring history in this regard. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that seems to have been the case and they meet, and it meets international standards. Uh, so um, I think there is reason to think that at the moment, the Iranian reaction here is a little bit overblown on that particular particular issue. But as you know, that reactor has had trouble coming into operation. And there was some early indication that it wasn't operating according to standards and had to be shut down and that some of the fuel had to be removed uh, because there was a problem with the fuel. So maybe our Iranian friends know more than the rest of us do. Rifkin, Oxford Research Group. Um, Tom, could you tell us more about the Israeli mindset at the moment, and how far have they built in? Have they bought into the idea that we have a longer time span, and ha is is a military attack still high on the agenda? Um, how, how are they thinking at the moment, and how far are they leaving it to the U.S. to act? Uh, thank you, Gabrielle, for those questions. I haven't been in Israel recently. The best that I know is the following, that there is now considerable debate in Israel about the effectiveness of military activity. A recent retirement and statement by a very senior Israeli security official of his doubts has added to the discussion and indeed the debate in Israel about whether military activity is useful. But I think it remains true in Israel that buying two years may be worth it. Um, my own view as well is that from what I can see, the Israeli view has been the US can do this much easier than we can. Uh, it is much better for the US to do it. Uh, why don't you please step out and make it happen? 
On the other hand, given some of the uncertainties about what might be the result of military action, I don't think the Israelis have taken a view other than some skeptical sense that diplomacy is impossible. Uh, and I don't feel that they have discouraged that. Uh, my feeling is that the newspapers have widely reported US-Israeli cooperation in the Stuxnet enterprise and perhaps in other areas which have set back the Iranian program. There's debate about how much time, but I think that there is more comfortable breathing in Israel today that there is some time than there has been in the past. I visited Israel in 2006 and had an opportunity then to speak with the head of Israeli military intelligence. And he told me and showed me all the pictures that in a year Iran would have a nuclear weapon. And I said, General, that's simply splendid, but that's been the Israeli position for the last five years. And he said, yes, that's our position. So, <laughs> so I think we have some time, not unlimited. I think that there is some reluctance to move in a military way, uh, but it might be reversed if it became apparent <coughs> that Iran was on the verge of a breakout of some kind. And that's a worrying proposition. I think it is also totally understood that even were Israel to go alone, the United States would also bear total responsibility for the effort. Uh, in some ways, that means that uh, were the effort to be undertaken uh, and to try to make it effective, and I have my doubts about that, a joint effort would make more sense than a single effort on the part of the Israelis. But those are only my conclusions. Okay. Thank you very much.